to Jenna D. Cole, and I just want to say thank you for being a guest on my talk show. Thank you for having me. Now, for people who want to know what Uncensored is, Uncensored is my way of showing people that even if a word in disability, I can still overcome controversy and reach my goals in life. At the same time, I'm able to turn myself into a perfect example for people out there dealing with any types of word and disabilities or disabilities. But you should never give up or have people label you. And you should prove to them you can still mount to something. With that being said, it's a half hour of your time. Have as much time as you like. And starting off, what can you tell us about yourself? Uh, well, I can tell you that I am originally from Los Angeles, California. I was born and raised there. My parents are Cuban. So I am really submerged in both cultures, the American and in the Latin culture. It's been a wonderful blessing to me to grow up in a Latin culture because it's facilitated a lot of the jobs that I've been able to get. Um, and it also brings me so much joy. I lived in Miami for some time and I've lived in New York for quite some time as well. And currently I'm in Portland working on a musical called Cuba Libre. Oh, that's really cool. What can you tell us about that? It's a story of Cuba in the early 90s. Um, there's, it, it's a wonderful sort of depiction of the reality and the harshness that Cuba has endured, particularly the Cuban people. Uh, a lot of the times when we think of Cuba, we think of this sort of very sexy, uh, taboo place to visit and now that's changing and we think uh you know lots of dancing and delicious food and um just all of the things that we are very well known for and this show does capture that essence but on a grander scale it really also demonstrates the reality of the harshness that the people who live there have had to endure because they've lived under a communist regime for the past 50 plus years. So that is in essence what the show is about. Oh, that's really cool. Yeah, it's awesome and we have a wonderful creative team. Um, we're developing the show in Portland, Oregon. So I'm here until mid-November and I'm really enjoying Portland. It's a great town. Uh, and in particular, working on the show is is a heart project for me because I come from a Cuban descendancy. So it's really nice to be able to tell a story, a very realistic story, uh, in regards to Cuba. No, no, absolutely. Now the next question is, what brought you to the States? And when you were in high school, did you do any sports? And the last question is, uh, when you were in college, were you studying or a party animal? <laughs> well, uh, what brought me to the arts when I was very young, I was always sort of singing and dancing around the house. And I have two brothers. I was the only girl. So I was a family ham. I was always walking around with a makeshift, makeshift microphone pretending to be singing and dancing around the house. There was always all kinds of music playing in my home. And my fa my parents were both really smart and kind of, you know, put me in a environment that would cultivate and really teach me how to do the things that I was doing naturally. So they put me in dance class and voice lessons and all of that. And I went to a performing arts middle school and a performing arts high school while I lived in Los Angeles. And uh, I loved it. So I didn't play any sports. Um, that wasn't really my talent. I tried to play soccer for one semester or like, like one term, but I ended up lasting about a week because I was much happier dancing than I was running across a field. And, um, midway through high school, I moved to Miami and I went to my local high school, but I was very much involved in the theater department. And then when I went to college, I started in the theater department, but I ended up uh, getting a degree in broadcast journalism, which I haven't had to ever really use because I've been very fortunate to do what I love. Yeah, absolutely. You know, how can I be stopped with the whole soccer thing? I'm sorry? Oh, you mentioned you, got, you didn't like well, running across the field. 
uh, how what got you interested in what uh, was the other reason you stopped was the soccer thing wasn't your thing it wasn't my thing I wasn't very good at it I was actually really clumsy <laughs> and I didn't like to run which I hadn't realized was a part of being on the soccer team um, so it, it was a little sort of short-lived uh, Sort of, a, it was just a short-lived fantasy of actually wanting to try to be an athlete, but that really wasn't my thing. Well, dude, you mentioned you were clumsy. Did he ever cause like any dog piles or pile-ups? <laughs> no, it's just nobody ever wanted to kick the ball my way because they knew that I wasn't going to be able to carry out what never play they were trying to make happen. So. I quickly realized that I was a contributor, a better contributor in other fields that were not the soccer field. Yeah, I hear you. I'm the same <laughs> way. I'm not really a runner. You know, when we used to do the mile run, I would try to run. Then halfway, it's like, eh, it doesn't matter. I'm not going to be running any marathon, so I'm just going to walk it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm yeah. not really a runner. Uh-huh, me either. We have that in common, Keith. <laughs> now, do you ever cross, and I was going to ask you, did he ever get the chance to do one of those human pyramids, or not a human pyramid girl? Not a human pyramid girl either. And I tried cheerleading for a little while, because I thought that was just so cool. But again, not my forte. So I would just end up back in the theater department singing and dancing. <laughs> And acting, which is what I should have been doing anyway. And luckily, I did. I stuck to that. No, who were your favorite? Now, I'm going to pass this over to you in a couple minutes. But the subject I was going to say before I cut myself off <laughs> was who influenced you to become an actress and singer? And how did all that come about? Well, as a kid, again, uh, I was just sort of the family just a very lively spirit in regards to music and dance. And my grandmother, who passed away when I was very young, I was five. But when I was born, she would tell my mom, she's going to be a performer. She's going to be a performer. And she would dress me up, like, because I have this wild curly hair. She would dress me up like Shirley Temple, and she would make me dance around the house, and she would uh, dress up, put makeup on my face and do poses like if I was in a fashion shoot and things like that. So I definitely feel like she had a hand in sort of in planting that seed, you know. And then again my parents because I I was always dancing around they were they were instrumental in really facilitating and 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 encouraging me to do what I love to do, what they saw I had a natural knack for. Coming from Cuba, they didn't have the opportunity to follow their dreams because in Cuba, the government there is a communist government. And so they left Cuba looking for opportunities in America. They sacrificed their lives in order to build a life here so that their children can make their dreams come true, even though they could not make their own dreams come true. So because of that, that's always sort of been very present to me, and I'm so grateful, you know. Um, so they were huge in just allowing me to be who I was and encouraging me to get training around the things that really lit me up so that I can have a career in that field. Um, and so, you know, I just I started dancing and singing as a kid, and then I got very involved in all of the projects and in school, I was part of all the clubs, and you know, I teach quite a bit, and when I talk to, to young performers, I always encourage them to take advantage of the resources that they have that are free in school, because that's available to them, and they don't have to pay for it. You know, a lot of the times, vocal lessons or dance lessons in a studio are pretty expensive, but if you have it available at your school, you can become involved and get training, or at least start to a conversation in the area and you're not paying for anything right so I did a lot of that and then life sort of just took over and and I auditioned for my first uh, theatrical show in Miami which was my first professional show as a paid actress and the theater bug bit which is how they say it happens and is true once that happened 
everything sort of started to take shape. I moved to New York and I auditioned for a bunch of shows and luckily I've been very fortunate and blessed to have a career in the performing arts. Oh, that's really cool. Now, before we go to the other subjects, I'm going to pass the show over to you. Was there anything you wanted to talk about? Any subjects you want to talk about? This is your time, after. I'm going to put you in a driver's seat, and you can ask me anything you want. Gloves off. Okay. Well, Keith, I just want to commend you for taking on this project and for being an inspiration and and a facilitator of showing people that you are fully capable of creating a life for yourself no matter what restrictions you may have. It's so inspiring and, and it inspires me and um, I'm grateful for you. I'm grateful for you reaching out to me and asking me to be a part of your show. Now, my question for you is, how has um, your condition, how do you feel it's limited you and how do you feel it's empowered you? All right. Um, let's see. So how it helped and how it hurt, basically. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, I would say like... For perfect and for <laughs> perfect example, if I can't, if I can get the words out, I'm tired. I'm. I apologize. Oh no, it's and okay. It's like ten twenty one my time, so I'm kind of like kind of course. Did it early. Open. <laughs> <laughs> so if I seem kind of out of it, I apologize. It's okay. It's okay. It's for fun. It didn't help. I let my disability hurt me for years. People say you're gonna be a burden to someone. You're going to end up being in a group home. you got to work retail for the rest of your life. And um, I don't know. I'm trying to avoid that by coming up with other ways, saying, hey, I can't go to college. My high school took a dump on me. I know everyone else in my family one time or another had a word in disability, but now but two of them are, are writers, one's a teaser. And as I can, the other two are off doing whatever. And they're like, if they can do it, there's no excuse why I can't. And I, one day I was like, screw it. I'm going to show people that even if we're in disability, I can still amount to something and overcome controversy, reach my goals in life. And at the same time, actually, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this shirt off. <laughs> don't mind, I'm wearing something underneath it. Yeah, I haven't, <laughs> I haven't, I never really wore this orange shirt in a while. So when I actually put it on today, I was like, oh, well, 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 it fits and everything. But it's <laughs> actually like itchy as hell. That's another <laughs> thing I'm going to ask you. <laughs> now, okay, now I uh, know it's uncensored. Oh, he's going to take his own Okay, you're comfortable. You're comfortable. That's good. Right. <laughs> but like you said, it's uncensored. It's not like I'm going to get neutered or anything. No, no. No, <laughs> no. So basically, I just got tired of Saying, never going to go to college, can't have a normal job, can't do this, I can't do that. And I was like, screw it, I'm going to show people that, hey, you labeled me as this, the school. I, I give you a perfect example. They said, go read this book. And it's like, it would go over my head. Because I, I learned it was hands-on. People say, oh, it sounds like a real porno thing. He learns hands-on. But it's true. If you give me like a computer or a mouse and you say, okay, or even a book, we're going to break this down for you. And we're going to go over it step by step. Not one, not two, but three or, or four. And we we're going to go over and over until you feel comfortable and we can do it, right? You understand it, right? You're not going to fuck up. <laughs> that, okay. that I will get to uncensored in a couple minutes. So I, basically, uncensored is trying to find words for it. I have my mind's always moving with the ADD. Um, some days it's better than others. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, I wanted to show people that said, I have ADD, I have social anxiety. I don't want to be a burden. 
I'm going to create my own talk show. And, um, you know, my mind's always processing today. Yesterday I started on uh, stage 32 going through everyone. Like, I can't snap my fingers, but snapping through, um, I think, 86 pages out of 866 people. And I went through it, emailing everyone. Even if I talked to them before, I reintroduced myself. Today I finished it, thank God. I left off on 50, and I got through it. Um, so I, I promote myself. I advertise myself. I'm doing the best I can with a word and disability. And if that's not good enough for people, I don't know what you want me to do. I can't scratch myself behind the ear. You know, that would be a talent too. <laughs> but, you know, I, I'm doing the best I can. Now, um, now that's going to the subject, how to hurt me, how this was helping me is now I worked in retail and I had social anxiety and I was, I was doing this a long time ago, 2000, and I had my own talk show back in high school, 2004, five and six, it wasn't as so what it is right now, I wish it was, but it was a high school show and because it was a high school show I couldn't really have guests and people weren't taking it seriously and um so I still had panic attacks I it was hard for me to walk up to people because I have a fear of being rejected still being rejected but now I just don't give a damn <laughs> he's like you ever guess set me for who I am or you're not um, so I worked in retail, I got sick out of it, after Hurricane Sandy, it's like, well, I need to do something, and can't prove people wrong by sitting at home and doing nothing, so I created my own talk show, and I did 72 interviews, don't ask me why, it seemed like a good idea at the time, <laughs> I, and, but I did 72 phone interviews. Basically, I was on speaker, and I was recording it from a camera, and it was a blank screen with audio. And as I got people from Mighty Bar from Power Rangers, Dragon Ball Z, from Spider-Man, and it still gets to me. You have this great format. Why aren't you as big or bigger when you portray yourself to be? Why don't you have sponsors? Why don't you have this? Why don't you have that? I don't know, would you like to help me with that? No, no, if you can't do it yourself and it's not meant to be, that's like, yeah, thanks. Like, I have none. I now like I have enough problems I have to juggle through. And anyway, and so I um, said, uh, I'm going to do it over. I talked to someone. He said, do it over. He said, what is your following? What is your demographic? Well, I'm not a cult leader, so I don't really care what my following is. And oh, that's not what you meant. That's not what you meant by your following. Uh, is it 18 and up? So I did it over. Now it's I say I only interview 21 and up. But you know, people can watch it. There's no rating system. I say uncensored, and people think, yo, oh, it's uncensored. You gotta say f this, f that. Uh, you gotta see the uh, bitches and hoes or whatever. But, um. Oh, no. <laughs> but uncensored, and I'm gonna say it once, say it again. Uncensored is freedom of speech, freedom of self expressing, and it's just how, for me, for you, and for everyone to express themselves. So that is what uncensored is. Are you, are you gonna use some profanity? Eh, that's up to you, or kings only. There's nothing wrong with that. Why is it constantly going to be, you know, blah, 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 over, over, no. Because then that gets redundant and people will think, okay, he says the F word for 45 minutes, so I guess he has a one-track mind. Why are we watching this? So if it comes up, okay, in the heat of the moment, or if I'm very passionate, I may use some word language, or you can say whatever you want. Um, but, you know, uncensored, freedom of speech, <laughs> freedom of speech, freedom of self-expression, it, it, that's basically what, how uncensored is for me. You know, a lot of people get offended. Oh, it's uncensored, so you got so boobies and you got to use the F word. I was like, first off, no, because I would be banned from YouTube 
and how would people see my talk show? Hello. And uh, and second of all, that's degrading. Now, if you want to do that, you're more than welcome to. You have as much freedom as you want. I, I'm not going to ask you. You, uh, you can do whatever you want, say whatever you want, do whatever you want. It makes it more for an entertaining show. <laughs> that is for sure. <laughs> so, I have another question for you. Who inspires you? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I get, yeah, I ask that a lot, and I keep pulling answers out of my ass. Um, You're funny, Keith. <laughs> I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I really don't know. I, I um... I guess uh, my dad influenced me to um, get started with this. It's my dad um, used to make high, high school yearbook videos for school. That's how I started to use iMovie and copy what he was doing. My brother uh, went on tour and he was on TV, so I, he thinks I'm an ass kisser. Maybe I am. <laughs> but we really don't get along that much, but I kind of wish we did. Because we were close at one time, and I, I do piss people off, but I'm not on purpose, because I don't know, I'm still working on it with my mannerisms, and it's like, you know, you don't mean to piss people off, it's just how you carry yourself, it's how you, uh, how you present, uh, present yourself, versus what I, I used to wear rock and roll t-shirts, and it's like, you wear something else, you look like a bum, or a drug addict, it's like, okay, thanks. Then I used to wear all gothics, and then so like, you know, we don't want to be seen with you like that. Then I was like, well, okay, and then I started copying whatever people are doing. But that's fine, but it doesn't seem to be you. And I'm like, I tried expressing myself, and you. <laughs> and it's like, so, okay, so now that I'm doing the talk show, people are saying, if you get one or two, five interviews, okay, they, I always thought, wouldn't it be cool, back in 2013, wouldn't it be cool, say I have over a hundred interviews, if I got, you know, 500 interviews, mm -hmm. and it's just, I'm doing the best I can, thanks to you, we're up to 248, so it's moving, you know, I don't want to get a whole religious thing or anything, but I'm thankful for God that he's letting me do this. And I hope he, um, my biggest fear is that I don't want to end up in a group home or die alone. But I, if God is letting me do this, then apparently I'm doing something right. And I just hope it keeps on moving, but I don't screw it up and piss him off in the process. <laughs> do you know he made you perfect? He did. And you wouldn't be doing what you're doing if you weren't meant to be doing it. You are perfect exactly the way you are. That's true. Yeah. It's, it's what is. I don't sometimes see it like that. You know, I kind of was sometimes I was able to drive or I didn't have a word of disability. But at the same time, how would I be doing a talk show if I didn't have a word of disability? What could I like this? If I didn't have a disability, why would I be doing this talk show, number one? I'd be like everyone else, saying, I have a talk show. I have a talk show. What can my talk show? My talk show is different. My talk show is better. <laughs> and it's, you know, but you do you know how many people don't have learning disabilities and aren't doing courageous things like this? That's why it's so inspiring that you have taken it upon yourself. To create something that you are passionate about. You did all of that. And people who don't have learning disabilities don't. So that's why it is so, I think, important for you to continue to be a voice for your community and for you to show people that you're an example. And one of the things in getting to know you in this conversation is that you are completely yourself. You are so authentic and you're so... Uh, likable and you're you're passionate about what you do and those things are infectious 
No, I appreciate it. And uh, while on the subject, if I didn't have a disability, if I was like you, maybe I would have uh, went to college. I may have tr uh, tried to become a professional wrestler. Um, is that is that a dream? It was. Yeah, I'm still working on it. But like you said, if I didn't have my disability, I wouldn't have that motivation of proving people wrong. I would be like another cork on the wheel of, okay, he's like this person, he's like that person. But, but you have a disability and you're doing this, that's something we can work with because it's different and it's unique. Absolutely. And it's 100% you. And what's beautiful is that you, you own who you are. And I know so many people who, who don't own who they are and don't have learning disabilities. And you own who you are. And that is so beautiful. Now, for our viewers who want to know what you mean by that, could you explain a little more? Sure. What I mean by you owning who you are is that you... You're not hiding, you're not hiding behind your disability. You, you own that you have a disability. You, you've taken it not as a hindrance, but as a platform. And you're using your disability to not hold you back, but to move you forward. So it shows that you can be under any circum kind of circumstance and still find something positive. Choose to focus on that as opposed to how it holds you back. That's what I mean by you owning who you are. And that is the most inspiring thing. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I don't, I know it doesn't sound like an ADD thing. Uh, as we're talking, I know it's a sky behind. That's a great shot behind you. Isn't and that so pretty? That's Portland. <laughs> well, if you're okay with it, would you mind? I like things to be interactive. Would you mind getting up, walking around? Oh, you don't have. You don't have I'll to. See, I'll show you my view. Hold on one sec. You don't have to, but I like things to be Find interactive. It? Hold on. What? I'm gonna turn the lights up a little bit. Hope I'm not imposing on you. My home, my casa is su casa, as they say. <laughs> okay, so this is my living room. And this is Portland. Downtown Portland. I'm opening the sliding door. Have you seen any Vesson? Have I seen any what? Have you, have you seen any Vesson or Guggenstaggers? No, what are those? Oh, did you watch Grimm? I don't! I know that shot here. <laughs> I should get into that. I don't have a lot of time right now, but maybe I will before I leave. Isn't it so beautiful? Oh, it's really nice. You're standing on the balcony with me. <laughs> so what brings you to Portland? I know you, uh, you said this way, but that's why again. So what brings you to Portland? That's why like an acting gig or is it a music gig? Yes. Yeah. It's the, it's the musical I was telling you about earlier. Uh, the show Cuba Libre. Whoa, bright light. Yes, yeah, so I'm working on that show while I'm here for two and a half months. Well, that's nice. Mm -hmm. Are you like the main star, secondary star, the lead? I'm one of the two leads. That's nice. Is that like a comedy? Um drama it's a little bit of everything it has some comedy in it but mostly it's a drama it's a musical so you can only get so dramatic <laughs> you know what i mean um but yes it's it's a it's a musical so there's a little bit of of drama and a little bit of comedy and a lot of music all right now the next question i was got to ask you is do you have any funny stories but you know, or if that has happened to you growing up, or if that happened to you on stage, did you ever pull any pranks on the people? No, I don't pull pranks because that would be really unprofessional and I would get fired. <laughs> but funny stories on stage, yes. 
So one time I was doing this show on Broadway called In the Heights, and I was on for one of the leads. I understudied the two other female lead parts. And I was on for one of the leads, and in one of the scenes, we had a champagne bottle that uh, my counterpart had to pretend to open. And so he does this whole bit while he's singing the song about, I can't open the champagne bottle, I can't open the champagne bottle, and the sh champagne bottle pops, and the cork goes flying into the audience, and all the champagne starts to spill all over the stage. So now he's singing about not opening the champagne, but the champagne is actually open. That bottle was never supposed to pop. It was supposed to have been sealed, but we had never experienced anything like that. So he had to make up lyrics on the spot that made sense with what just happened. It was very exciting. And we had to figure out what to do to keep going on with the scene and the song. So that was pretty exciting. And the people there, are, we had what we called super fans that would come to the shows all the time because we had a, a special prize seating for the front row. Um, the super fans who had seen the show hundreds of times, I imagine, were very excited to see that champagne bottle pop because it was only for that performance only. <laughs> <laughs> So yes, that's one story. That's one story of things. And things like that happen all the time. It's what's so amazing about live theater. You never know how it's going to go down. You can only hope that the show runs, runs smoothly and that no quirks happen. But if a quirk happens, you got to just roll with the punches. That's true. Yeah, I have a funny story. Um, well, first off, has anyone ever told you that you would be perfect for April O'Neil? No, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the funny story I was going to say to you was, uh, I won't mention the store that I work in, but actually, yeah, I don't work there anymore. I used to work at U.S. Polo. Horrible, horrible store. And it's, I don't know, I guess it was just the people. I have nothing against the company, but it's just the people I work with for us assholes. Mm -hmm. And I... In every store, in Sears and JCPenney, you return an item, and you say, how can I help you today? I'll have a return. Pretend you're just a customer. I, what's, um, you're the, um, what's my line, Keith? What's my uh, line? You're the sales associate. I'm the customer. Okay. It just so, for example, okay. you would say, hi, how are you today? Did you find everything you're looking for? I would say, yes, yeah, sure, it's, it's fine, and it, I just need a return. What's wrong with the item? It's Something's wrong with it. I just need a return. In every store, Sears, JCPenney, KB Toys, Toys R Us, whatever, they always say, what's wrong with the item? Is there anything wrong with it? And that's it. I didn't, I swear to God, I did not do anything wrong. So, <laughs> so this stupid ass guy, uh, he had his croc, uh, uh, Indiana Jones slash croc, uh, crocodile Gundy looking hat. And, <laughs> and so he's like, how did I uh, have a return? Uh, okay. Uh, is there anything wrong with it? No, I just, the zipper's broke. I want to return, okay? No problem. I uh, said, called for a manager on the, um, the walkie. While well, we were waiting, I was like, so, um, any theories on what happened? Do you know what happened to it? How did it break? He walked right at me and says, are you being a wise ass to me? I see, uh, that's my interpretation. But he really said, are you being wise to me? He said wise, but he didn't say ass, because he was in the store. But he, he, he did say wise ass, because he said wise. And I was like, oh, wow, I know where this is going. Uh -huh. It's like, are you being wise to me, boy? Are you being wise? And I'm like, no, I'm doing my job. That's what you say. Was there anything wrong with it? 
Do you know what happened to it? Where's our manager? I don't like your ad. And, and by the way, the guy isn't black. He's white. White and Australian. But I'm just doing it to be funny. And so the guy's going off saying I was being a wise ass. But I was being you know, was so wise to him. And I was like, I was doing my job. I was so pissed. And the manager is there. The guy sort of this other guy who rung him up. And, you know, they just so can't like, hey, it's good to see you again. And I walk around with a jacket. Oh, we turn it. He turns around, looks right at me. And it's like, I don't know if you can see it in my face. It's like, <laughs> and, and I said, look, I didn't mean any disrespect. I was doing my job. I apologize. Yeah, well, you shouldn't have been a wise ass to me. And I was like, you know what? Master came out, I went in the back, I was biting my lip, and she said, what happened? I told her, and he said, like, he, he said I was being a wise ass. Well, wise, a.k.a. wise ass, and she said, oh, well, that's not what he said. He said, you were rude, you were disrespectful, and I'm like, oh, my God, this guy is Indiana Jones out there. It's probably missing some stones. Have you seen the hat you all done? Someone should throw a net over him. And... <laughs> the, the guy wasn't all there. So basically, he's like, the customer is always right. Even mm -hmm. when they're wrong. The customer. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, uh, wrapping up, do you have any um, words of wisdom you want to say to your fans and listeners? How they can follow you on social media? Oh, sure. So you can follow me on Facebook at Janet DeCall. Um, you can also follow me at Twitter at Janet DeCall. And you can also visit my website, www.JanetDeCall.com. 